Good afternoon, everyone. We'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining our webinar, City and County Posting Compliance, New Laws and Trends. A quick note before we get started. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation using the chat feature on your screen. We will respond immediately to any technical concerns, and we will try to answer as many questions as we can about the material presented via follow-up emails after the presentation. And without further ado, here is Ashley Kaplan, our in-house senior employment law attorney. Ashley has been practicing labor and employment law for more than 20 years, representing employers in a variety of matters, from discrimination and harassment litigation to defending FLSA class action lawsuits. Here at Poster Guard, Ashley handles our legal compliance and also oversees the teams responsible for researching all the posting laws and developing compliance solutions to meet our customers' diverse needs. As a special offer to our attendees today, Ashley will be available to set up a complimentary personal consultation about your specific posting compliance needs. If you are interested, please indicate that in the question box. We will contact you to set it up. And now, here's our presenter, Ashley Kaplan. Thank you, and welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to cover some important information about labor law posting compliance and a growing trend we're seeing when it comes to city and county posting requirements. Labor law posting compliance can be complicated enough just on a federal and state level. You know there are now up to 21 required postings in a given state, and um, on top of that, there's been such an increase in the rate of change. There's now about 150 state law poster changes a year nationwide. But if you have locations in certain cities or counties, there are additional employee postings to worry about. And that can actually be up to nine additional postings um, in a given location. And of course, the city and local postings, the city and county postings change frequently too. So there's a lot to keep up with. So today we're going to cover these additional city and county posting requirements, um, including recent changes, the latest changes that have come in over the past few months. And then at the end of the presentation, we're going to highlight some pending changes we're watching on a city and county level. So you'll know what to expect over the next few months in terms of mandatory poster changes, um, or at least the ones that we know are already coming. Lots of these requirements pop up practically out of nowhere with very little notice. Um, but we'll talk about that a little bit more today, too. Okay, first let's start with just a basic understanding of labor law posting compliance today, and then we're going to move into the details about what it takes to be in full compliance with today's requirements on a local level and why it matters. So first of all, um, today's posting compliance environment is more complex than ever. Um, as most of you probably already know, all businesses in the U.S., um, if you have um, you know, one or more employees, um, businesses have to post both federal and state employee notices. Um, and like I said, if you're in a city or county that has mandatory posting requirements, you have to post those too. Um, at this time, there are, uh, currently there are six mandatory federal posters. These are the posters on a federal level, um, and I've listed them out here on this slide. First, there's the posting issued by the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and this one covers anti-discrimination provisions and um, protected characteristics under federal law. Next is the OSHA posting, and this one highlights important provisions of the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Um, next on the list is the FMLA. This is the Family and Medical Leave Act uh, mandatory posting. Um, then we have USERA, which stands for the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act. Um, and this notice covers reemployment after military leave, anti-discrimination provisions, um, and then other issues like health insurance affecting veterans and those um, serving in the military. Um, then there are two more on the list, and both of these actually had mandatory updates in uh, 2016 at the end of the year. I just wanted to point that out. Um, first, there's the FLSA, the Fair Labor Standards Act posting. And this one notifies employees about the federal minimum wage rate, um, overtime rules, and um, there's a lot of information on there about child labor laws, um, federal child labor laws as well. The mandatory update in, uh, at the end of 2016, it was actually um, issued, I think, in July or August, incorporated a few major changes. Um, the changes included information about misclassification of independent contractors, um, not the exempt, non-exempt classification issue, that's separate, 
Um, but this poster update had information about misclassifying independent contractors. Um, also included information about mandatory breaks for nursing mothers, um, and also the increased penalties under the Civil Penalties Inflation Adjustment Act. Um, and that's a law that actually increased um, the penalties for various violations under federal employment laws, including posting violations which we're going to talk about in a minute when we go over the risks of noncompliance. But that was part of the reason why this poster had to be updated, because um, they were addressed on the poster. And then finally, there is the EPPA, which stands for the Employee Polygraph Protection Act. And this one lets employees know the rules around lie detector tests in employment. And um, it, this poster is mandatory, of course, even if you don't use lie detector tests. Um, I get that question a lot. Um, and the reason this poster was updated um, in 2016 was also to reflect changes in the penalty structure under the Civil Penalties Inflation Adjustment Act, just like the FLSA poster. Um, and like I said, that law actually affected penalties under most federally enforced employment laws, but um, these two posters were the only ones that had mandatory updates because of it. You know, each agency operates independently, so um, sometimes there's not a lot of consistency um, across agencies or, you know, reflected in the posters. Okay, so those are the federal posting requirements. And then on a state level, there are additional mandatory postings that are required for every business. Depending on what state you're in, this can add up to 15 additional posters. Um, so that would be a total of up to 21 federal and state postings per location. And this area of compliance on a state level um, is definitely becoming more complex and difficult to manage over the years because more and more laws are being passed on a state level giving employees protection and employment. And whenever there's a new law, there's a potential poster update or in some cases a brand new poster, a brand new law that never existed before. Um, even as we see laws you know, being rolled back or changed or you know, tweaked in any way, um, and not necessarily giving employees more protection, um, the result is usually a poster change, a mandatory poster update. Um, these state posters cover topics um, typically um, such as state minimum wage rates, fair employment, unemployment insurance, workers' compensation, um, state, state laws around smoking in the workplace, paid sick leave, um, child labor, and then some of the newer areas that we're starting to see like human trafficking, expanded family care rights, and even um, electronic cigarettes in the workplace. So um, like I said, on top of this, you may have additional posting obligations if you're in certain cities or counties with their own posting requirements. And this is an area where we've really seen a lot of growth. There has been so much growth um, in terms of the number of new city and county postings being issued and also the number of updates to these posters. Um, and that's really taken off over the past couple of years. And of course, that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, like I mentioned, you can have up to nine additional postings just for city or county compliance. Um, the city with the most, the one with nine postings, is actually San Francisco, um, and I'll get into the specifics on that. But there are other cities and counties with multiple posters as well. It's not just San Francisco. So um, as you can see, there's a lot to keep up with to stay in compliance. Um, and then on top of this, if you're in certain industries, or if you have any government contracts, um, federal government contracts, or if you have a significant number of employees who are not proficient in English, um, then there are even more mandatory posting requirements that would apply to you. Um, federal contractors, for example, now have up to 15 additional postings, um, depending on what kind of contracts you have, and in some cases the amounts of the contracts. But it could be up to 15 additional postings on top of what we're talking about. Okay, um, another thing that a lot of people aren't really familiar with is that there is not a one-stop shop for free government posters. So there's not a central place or a website where you can get all the posters you need for your particular location or your business. There's actually, across the nation, there are about 175 different agencies that are responsible for issuing these posters, and that's just on a federal and state level. And right now, there are about 370 different mandatory posters on a federal and state level. Um, and that, of course, doesn't take into account all the additional local postings, uh, you know, the city and county postings that I've talked about or any of the Fed contractor posters. So in any given state, 
just managing posting compliance in one state, an employer would have to go to up to nine different agencies just to get the required posters for federal and state law compliance. Um, and then on top of that, there are more than 22,000 cities and counties, um, and each has its own governing agencies and you know, ordinances to monitor. Luckily, not all cities and counties have posting requirements. Um, but, you know, when I say there are more than 22,000 cities and counties out there, um, they, not all of them have a mandatory poster, but a lot of them do. And like I said, we're seeing this number grow every day. Um, and none of these agencies, by the way, whether it's federal, state, or local, these agencies don't have work share agreements where one agency provides all the posters that a sister agency requires. In some cases, there are a couple of states that do a good job. Some agencies try to help out, and you'll see some crossover where one agency might have posters that are governed or enforced by another agency. But it's not a complete list, and uh, there's just not a one-stop shop where you can get everything you know, on a federal and state level that you need for full compliance, and certainly not when we, um, on a city-county level. Um, the local agencies really operate on their own, um, really independently from the state and federal agencies. So um, we don't see any crossover there. Um, Okay, um, adding to this complexity is the fact that posting changes are also on the rise. Um, our legal team here at Poster Guard monitors and tracks all the posting changes on a daily basis, and on average, we now see about 150 state law posting changes a year. And every time there's a posting change, the legal team reviews the underlying laws to determine if it's mandatory or non-mandatory and at least half of the state law changes do require a mandatory update um, you know, or an immediate replacement of the poster. On a local level um, for city and county, sometimes we get two or three mandatory changes in a week. Um, it really just depends and also depends on the time of year. Um, and this increasing rate of change at the state and local level is actually a trend that's expected to gain even more momentum in the coming years with the new administration. Um, you know, as states and cities continue to pass more and more laws addressing employee rights or even updating existing employment laws, um, not necessarily expanding rights, it could go either way, but this is actually a common response when there's either a deadlock at the federal level or an effort to deregulate at the federal level. Um, this is a common response where states and cities kind of step in and pick up the pace and um, pass their, their own legislation. Another problem is that government agencies don't notify businesses when these posting changes occur. So this can be really difficult because the posting requirements and the notice of change, uh, you know, when posters change, that information can be buried on different agency website pages. It's not always easy to find. And a lot of times the old posters will remain up and active on the website links um, even though they're non-compliant with no information about, you know, that there's a new poster, um, you just sort of have to dig around and find a, a completely separate page or link. Um, and then sometimes the posting guidelines can be buried in statutes, um, they can be in regulations, or even um, in case law. We've seen that on, with the city and county posting. Sometimes um, the requirements around the posters are, are actually in case law, um, court cases. So it can be difficult to find posting changes. and um, also difficult to interpret whether the updates are mandatory with compliance deadlines or just cosmetic, and also difficult to um, determine what the compliance deadlines are. It's, it's uh, not always black and white. Okay, there's um, one more area I wanted to cover really quickly before we jump into the specific city and county posting laws, and this is the cost of noncompliance. Um, I included this slide because there's a lot of confusion about the risks associated with labor law posting compliance, and there have been some recent changes to the penalties to cover that. Um, so I get a lot of questions on this, and I hear two things a lot. Um, the first is that government posting fines are so small that it doesn't really matter if we get caught. And the second thing I hear a lot is, well, there are no poster police out there, so how would I ever get caught anyway? So I'm going to address both of these um, misconceptions um, really briefly. First, when it comes to the amount of the fines, the amounts are actually pretty significant, um, and they can certainly add up if you have the same types of violations at multiple locations. The penalty structures are per location or per violation, so they can add up. 
in the statute for the regular federal postings, just talking about federal postings, the government is now authorized to fine up to $33,000 per location for posting violations. It's actually $33,486. And that's based on the most recent increases that just went into effect in January 2017. Um, and government fines uh, typically are imposed either for missing posters or outdated or old posters. And as I mentioned when I was talking about the federal poster, um, the federal poster requirements on the very first slide, this penalty amount first increased as part of the Civil Penalties Inflation Adjustment Act. Um, that went into effect in 2016 and caused those two mandatory poster updates. Before that, the fines, the federal fines for posting violations were only um, around $17,000 combined. So that's a pretty significant increase. It's um, almost doubled. And um, the Civil Penalties Inflation Adjustment Act actually calls for increases going forward each year to keep in line with the inflation rate. So um, they were increased again in January 2017, and um, they're expected to gradually increase going forward each year. So that's for the federal postings. On a state and local level, the government posting fines are typically between $100 and $1,000 per violation. Each posting has its own fines attached to it, so they're really all over the place. Um, there is a California poster, I think, that carries a, a heavier fine. I think it's $7,000. But um, in general, this range here on the side is pretty accurate. Um, like I said, every agency and every posting law is different. But in my experience, I typically see um, state and local fines come in in the range of about $500 or, you know, up to $750 per violation. Okay, um, the second misconception I mentioned is that there are no poster police out there. So there's really no need to worry about government posting fines. Well, the reality is the government rarely, the federal government rarely sends out representatives to businesses just to enforce posting laws. That's true. Um, we actually have seen this on a state and city level, where there have been poster sweeps by enforcing agencies or even the state attorney general. But on a federal level, government posting fines typically are assessed because the agency's on your premises for another reason. Um, it could be an immigration-related issue. It could be an OSHA inspection, an EEOC on-site investigation, um, or even uh, more commonly, just a Department of Labor audit that you know, was triggered by some kind of employee complaint, you know, you know, a current or former employee. And the complaint or the investigation um, is usually completely unrelated to the posters, but of course the agencies always check posting compliance as part of any on-site visit. It's one of the first things in their um, field operation handbooks to look for. But the real danger when it comes to posting violations is actually related to employee lawsuits and employee disputes. Um, it's not just about government posting fines. And there are a few different ways that posting compliance comes into play with employee lawsuits. Um, the first, and I think the most significant, is when it comes to the statute of limitations. Um, in my experience defending businesses and employment litigation, I like to refer to the statute of limitations as an employer's best friend because this is the defense that allows you to have a claim stricken, um, you know, completely dismissed just because it was filed too late, you know, even if there is an underlying violation. These can be erased and dismissed. Um, the statute of limitations, for example, in a federal discrimination claim is 300 days. Um, in a Fair Labor Standards Act case for, you know, overtime or misclassification or, min or um, wages owed is two years. So typically, if you get a claim from a former employee um, or, or a current employee for a violation that occurred outside of that window, outside of that time period, you can move to have it dismissed and avoid all the legal fees and potential liability for the claims in the lawsuit. Um, you can also use it to, it also cuts off damages for violations that occurred before that statutory time period kicked in. So it's really helpful, it's really important um, as a defense in almost every case, especially if you have multiple plaintiffs or a repeated violation um, that goes back into time. The problem is, if you have a posting violation, either you didn't display the current poster or you're missing a poster, Courts have begun to publish more and more decisions saying that if an employee didn't have proper notice of their rights, that the statute of limitations is extended or told and you cannot use it as a defense. So we've seen cases where normally an old claim could have been dismissed, um, thrown out, 
where the court allowed the plaintiff to pursue the claim, and it ended up in a six-figure judgment just because the posters were not up on the wall. Another way that posting compliance comes into play is as evidence of bad faith, and that could be in any related employment lawsuit, any of the laws reflected in these posters, whether it's Fair Labor Standards Act or discrimination or an ADA case. Each law is a little different in terms of the legal standards, but a finding of bad faith or lack of good faith, depending on the legal standard, can directly affect your damages, either by inflating a damage award against you, or it could stand in the way of a good faith defense that you might have tried to assert that would otherwise have reduced or eliminated your damages. It stands in your way. And we are seeing more and more cases where posting compliance is one of the factors that courts look at when they're assessing these kinds of damages relating to good faith or bad faith. By the way, we have a white paper with all the case law on this. There are lots of examples where this is played out, these theories that I'm talking about. So if you'd like a copy, just indicate that using the chat feature, and we'll be sure to email it to you after the presentation. And then finally, there's a point on here. Under the FMLA, you can actually be faced with a civil lawsuit if the failure to post ended up interfering with someone's FMLA rights, like if they didn't have the information they needed to know how long they had to be out, that they needed medical certs, how to return to work. So if it caused harm, there could be grounds for a civil lawsuit. So these are pretty severe consequences that you need to be aware of. It goes beyond government posting fines, and obviously good reasons not to take posting compliance lightly. Okay, so we're going to jump into specific city and county posting requirements and some recent changes. Like I said, this is a trend we've been watching over the past few years, and it continues to grow rapidly. The number of cities and counties requiring employers to post labor law notices is really growing quickly because we're seeing so many local governments passing more and more ordinances, giving employees certain rights and protections, usually going beyond what is already provided by federal or state law. The legal team at Poster Guard monitors these. We're monitoring and tracking them daily and analyzing new legislation and ordinances as soon as they come out. And every time a new law comes out, we're analyzing it to determine if they require mandatory postings. So not every law has a posting requirement, but the list is really growing fast. And we'll get into some examples. And by the way, Poster Guard actually covers every single local jurisdiction in the United States now. As I mentioned earlier, there are more than 22,000 local jurisdictions to monitor, cities and counties. And we now automatically include these local posters with your regular federal and state poster service. So if you're a Poster Guard member, there's nothing you need to do or ask for. If your city or county has a mandatory posting requirement, the poster will be sent to you automatically with your federal and state posters. And then if any of the posters, federal, state, or city, or county, have mandatory updates, you'll automatically get the new or updated poster sent to you. Also, when it comes to the city and county posters, a lot of these are brand new posting requirements that never existed before. So if a new posting requirement comes out while you're on the Poster Guard service, we automatically get that new poster out to you as well. So fortunately, like I said, not every city or county has a mandatory poster, but we sure are seeing the list grow quickly and sending out the posters to get you up to full compliance. The city and county postings cover a variety of employment laws similar to the state posters. So cities have the discretion to pass laws that are more generous to employees than under state or federal law. So for example, a lot of cities have their own higher minimum wage rate. Another example that we see a lot is they may have their own paid medical leave rules that are more generous than under state law. They might have different discrimination provisions with different protected characteristics that are covered. For example, some cities recognize sexual orientation as a protected characteristic, even though state law may not. So there can really be a lot of different laws that have to be followed and that are reflected in the posters. So another question that I get a lot is whether you have to post the city posters in addition to the state and federal posters. So for example, if your city has a minimum wage poster 
and the city minimum wage is higher than the state or federal? Do you still have to post the state and federal posters? And the answer is yes. Um, the reason is because sometimes the laws, it can be really subtle, but sometimes the laws have different um, legal definitions. They might cover different employees or define employees differently. Um, and like I said, these differences can be subtle. But um, in any case, you um, do have to post all three versions, even if they conflict um, on their face, even if they're three totally different minimum wage rates that seem to apply to the exact same group of employees. Um, of course, as a business, you have to follow the law that is the most generous to the employee, but you still have to post all three versions of the poster. Okay, um, now we're going to review some specific city posting requirements, um, and we're going to focus on the ones that are the most recently enacted and also the ones that affect the largest areas. Um, and we're also covering some that um, are new trends that are taking off and starting to reach new areas, growing trends that um, we expect to see kind of um, take off in the next year. Um, obviously, we're not going to have time to cover every local posting requirement today, but um, I wanted to let you know if you want more information about a specific city or county that we don't cover, if you, you, know, if you operate in a certain um, area that we don't get to today, just indicate that as a question um, or you know, use the chat feature and, um, or just email us and we will follow up with you after the presentation to go over the specifics that um, apply to your, your area or your location. Okay, we're going to start with San Francisco posting requirements. As I mentioned, there are actually nine postings required for employers operating in San Francisco. And of course, these posters need to be displayed in addition to the federal and California state posters. So that means in San Francisco, you would have about 30 postings um, required at each site when you include federal, state, and local requirements. I think there are 15 state posters plus the nine city posters and then the six federal posters. So, um, you know, obviously that's pretty overwhelming to try to keep up with. Um, but in any event, um, the first mandatory poster for San Francisco uh, that we're going to cover is a fairly new poster um, called the Paid Parental Leave Poster. And this one applies to San Francisco employers with 20 or more employees. And it has to be posted in English, Spanish, and Chinese. Um, the poster itself informs employees of the right to paid time off. Uh, for certain parental responsibilities, and that's all spelled out in the poster. Um, this new posting requirement went into effect for the first time on January 1st, 2017. The second mandatory posting in San Francisco um, is the employment discrimination poster. And this one just generally informs employees about the city's anti-discrimination laws. And it has to be posted by all San Francisco employers. Um, and this poster is actually issued and enforced by the city's Human Rights Commission. The third mandatory poster for San Francisco is the paid sick leave poster. Um, this posting informs employees about their rights when it comes to absences or you know, missing work or time for um, any kind of illness. Um, this one also has to be posted by all San Francisco employers and it has to be posted in English, Spanish, and Chinese. Um, this poster actually changes pretty frequently. The um, latest mandatory update was just issued in January 2017, but it um, does change pretty frequently. Um, by the way, whenever a poster has to be posted in multiple languages by every employer, even if all your employees are proficient in English, like these San Francisco posters that I've talked about, um, whenever that's the case, Poster Guard automatically includes the foreign language versions in your regular English service. So um, again, this isn't something you need to ask for. If it's required for all employers, even if all your employees um, are proficient in English, if that's what the law says, then it's something that we automatically include to make sure you're in compliance. Um, and that's true on a federal and state level as well. Um, and there are actually a lot of state posters that have this requirement, that have to be posted in other languages, typically, typically in Spanish, even if all your employees are proficient in English. So it's important to make sure you're covered on this. Um, I think it's almost 50 posters nationwide that have to be posted in both languages for all employers. Next is the San Francisco minimum wage poster. This one also um, must be posted by all San Francisco employers, and it has to be posted in English, Spanish, and Chinese. Um, this poster also changes frequently, and it requires mandatory replacements or updates um, each time because the city 
typically implements minimum wage increases on an annual basis. So, um, you know, with um, each time the poster needs to be updated. The new um, poster typically comes out in the middle of each calendar year. Um, this, a lot of minimum wage posters come out in January, but um, that's not true for all of them. And of course, all the other posters that don't address minimum wage come out throughout the year. There's really no rhyme or reason. Um, for this poster, the latest mandatory update was issued in June 2016, um, with the minimum wage increasing to $13 an hour. That, that the law went into effect July 1st, 2016. Um, we do expect another mandatory update um, in the summer, when the minimum wage is set to increase again to $14 an hour, um, and the law goes into effect July 1st, 2017. The fifth mandatory posting for San Francisco is the Healthcare Security Ordinance poster. Um, this one has to be posted by San Francisco employers with 20 or more employees. Um, it also has to be posted in English, Spanish, and Chinese. Um, this poster informs employees of um, the required minimum healthcare expenditure rates. And this one also, the information on this poster also changes whenever the healthcare expenditure rates increase. And that is typically on an annual basis. Um, for this one, it's typically around the beginning of the calendar year or just in time for the beginning of the calendar year. This one was actually last updated. The last mandatory update was November 2016. Um, and then the next mandatory posting for San Francisco is the Family Friendly Workplace Ordinance poster. Um, this one has to be posted by all San Francisco employers with 20 or more employees, and it also has to be posted in English, Spanish, and Chinese. Next is a poster called the Fair Chance Ordinance poster. Um, this one has to be posted in English, Spanish, and Chinese by all San Francisco employers with 20 or more employees. Um, and this posting has information um, for employees about the rules that the business must follow when it comes to applicants and employees' prior arrests, conviction records, and um, criminal background information. So this is a trend we are seeing take off in a lot of cities as well as on the state level where the legislature is protecting individuals from being excluded from employment or other opportunities based on their criminal background records. Um, obviously, this is affecting job applications too, you know, what you can, can or can't ask applicants about their criminal history. And, um, you know, it's referred to as the ban the box law. And this is something we expect to see in a lot more states and cities based on pending legislation that we're watching. Um, it seems to be a trend that's really kind of picking up momentum. Um, the next mandatory employee notice is a no smoking poster. Um, the laws are really strict about smoking in San Francisco, and so are the posting requirements. So this poster um, is called the no smoking at building entrance poster, and it has to be posted by all San Francisco employers. And the law actually specifies exactly what the sign must say, how big the lettering must be, how the um, smoking emblem, uh, the, the uh, image, um, how it must look, and also where it must be displayed. So in this case, it has to be within 10 feet from the building entrance and between 5 to 8 feet from the ground. Um, this poster is issued and enforced by the San Francisco Department of Public Health, but I want to emphasize that it is considered a labor law posting because it's required for your employees as well as for the general public. Um, San Francisco employers are also required to post another no smoking sign. It's a general notice. Um, it has to be posted inside the premises. And um, this poster has to be posted by all San Francisco employers, and it also has strict size, font, and content requirements. So San Francisco, like I said, has the most postings of any single city, but um, I wanted to mention there are a lot of other cities in California with mandatory employee postings as well. Some have one, two, maybe three. Um, or more, but um, not up to nine. Um, examples are Pasadena, San Jose, Richmond, Sunnyvale, Mountain View, Emeryville, Berkeley, Cupertino, Oakland, Los Altos, Palo Alto, Santa Clara, El Cerrito, Los Angeles, Los Angeles County, San Diego, San Mateo, and Santa Monica. Um, most of these are, um, or they include minimum wage postings and most of them did have mandatory updates in December 2016 to reflect um, January 1, 2017 minimum wage increases. So most of these had mandatory updates in December. Um, here on this slide is a sample of a fairly new posting required in the city of Los Angeles. And um, the city recently passed a fair chance ordinance 
that significantly limited the ability of Los Angeles employers to ask applicants and employees about criminal convictions. This is that ban the box trend um, for job applications that I just talked about. And in this case, it also had a mandatory posting requirement. They don't always require posters um, that, you know, cities and counties and states um, that adopt ban the box rules, but um, this one does have a mandatory posting requirement. Um, and this poster was required um, as of January 22nd, 2017. Um, by the way, I know that I'm moving pretty quickly through all these posters, um, so I'm trying to cover as many as possible, but I wanted to let you know, you will be getting a copy of this presentation deck, um, if that helps. I know we um, usually send them out as a follow-up to everyone who actually attends the um, webinar, so um, look for an email on that after the presentation. You will get the full deck. Okay, before moving on from California, I wanted to mention something Los Angeles County did um, last year. It caused a lot of confusion. Um, so the city of Los Angeles approved an ordinance in 2015 that established a citywide minimum wage, um, and it also had yearly scheduled increases that um, ended up um, with a $15 an hour minimum wage that goes into effect by 2020 for employers with 26 or more employees. So employers with 26 or more employees, by 2020, these yearly increases are going to um, rise up to $15 an hour minimum wage. For employers with 25 or fewer employees, um, they would be begin paying $15 an hour in 2021. So that's the first poster you see on this slide. It's sort of a stepping scale minimum wage increase poster. But following the city's lead, the county of Los Angeles also passed a minimum wage ordinance with the same wage schedules as the city. However, the county's version only applies to unincorporated areas of the county. So the interesting part for some businesses is just trying to determine whether you're located in an unincorporated area of LA County. Um, it can be difficult because of the way that the borders in LA County work. It's not like a, a clean, easy line or system. So to help employers comply, the county actually created a tool explaining to businesses how to determine if they are in an unincorporated area of the county and thus um, subject to this you know, county minimum wage law or um, if they're outside of it. Uh, but either way, whether you're located in the city of Los Angeles or unincorporated areas of LA County, you need to have a local minimum wage poster up um, to be in compliance. I also wanted to mention another new trend that we're starting to see on the local level um, in California. The city of San Jose recently approved the San Jose Opportunity to Work Ordinance. And that requires employers to offer additional work hours to their existing qualified part-time employees before they can hire new employees, um, including subcontractors or temps um, from a staffing agency. They have to offer it to their um, existing qualified part-timers first. Um, San Francisco has a similar ordinance called the Formula Retail Employee Rights Ordinance um, that just applies to certain industries, but San Jose's new law is unique because it applies to all industries um, in San Jose. Um, and we actually ant anticipate more cities um, passing ordinances like this on this topic, especially in California. Um, it's something that we're watching closely. The uh, San Jose um, ordinance did include a posting requirement. By the way, it went into effect um, recently on March 13th, 2017. That's a new posting requirement for San Jose. Okay, um, now shifting gears a little bit and moving to the East Coast. There are several postings required for employers operating in Philadelphia. There are actually seven mandatory postings right now on a city level. The first mandatory poster is called the Philadelphia Wage Theft Poster. Um, this one applies to all employers and provides employees with information on how to file complaints for unpaid wages. Um, the second mandatory poster is called the Philadelphia Fair Chance Poster, and this poster applies to empl all employers, regardless of size, and provides information about the rules um, the business has to follow when it comes to applicants and employees, prior arrests, conviction records, and related criminal background information. So this is just, you know, another city with a ban-the-box law that includes a mandatory posting requirement. The third is the Philadelphia Domestic Violence Poster. Um, this one is required for all Philadelphia businesses, regardless of size, and it provides information to employees about the Philadelphia law 
that gives um, victims of domestic violence certain rights and employment, like job protected time off. Um, this posting is issued and enforced by the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations. This is another area where we're starting to see more pending legislation on a, a city and county level um, in other areas. Um, next, there is the Philadelphia Employment Discrimination Poster. And this one um, lets employees know about the city's anti-discrimination laws, and it has to be posted by all Philadelphia employers. Um, this one's also enforced by the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations. The fifth mandatory poster for Philadelphia is the Pregnancy Accommodation Poster. Um, this one is also required for all employers in Philadelphia. Um, it's also issued by the Phil Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations. Sixth mandatory poster is called the Philadelphia Paid Sick Time Poster. Um, this one's required for Philadelphia employers with 10 or more employees, and it informs employees of their um, paid, sick paid sick leave rights under that law. Um, then we have Philadelphia's version of the no smoking poster. Um, this one's also required for all employers in Philadelphia. And um, it is also considered a labor law posting um, for, you know, protection of employees and, you know, employee facing. And um, it's enforced by the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. Um, okay, before I move on from Philadelphia, I wanted to mention another local trend that we're monitoring, and it began in Philadelphia. Um, in early 2017, Philadelphia became the first U.S. city to um, enact this law prohibiting employers from asking job applicants about their salary history. Uh, so this is different from ban the box. You know, we're, not, we're not talking about criminal history. We're just talking about a general inquiry about an applicant's past salary um, and uh, their salary history in general. So this ordinance was signed on January 23rd, and it is um, going into effect May 2017. And um, it specifically prohibits employers from asking job applicants about their prior salary or requiring disclosure of salary history as a condition of employment. And the purpose of the law is to close the wage gap between uh, men and women. The ordinance um, in Philadelphia did not contain, did not have a posting requirement. Um, you know, in this case it didn't. But based on pending legislation that we're watching, we do anticipate a lot of other cities and possibly um, some states to pass similar laws that will include posting requirements. So that, that is something that we're watching for new posters. Um, in New Jersey, there are several cities with mandatory posting requirements. Um, first, there's Jersey City, where all employers have to post the Jersey City Earned Sick Time poster. Um, this poster informs employees of their right to take paid time off um, for different kinds of illness or medical problems. Um, it has to be posted in English and in any other language if spoken by at least 10% of the workforce. In Newark, New Jersey, all employers have to post the Newark paid sick leave poster, um, and that's similar to the Jersey City poster. This one has to be posted in English and any language if spoken by 10% of the workforce. In Trenton, New Jersey, all employers have to post the Trenton Paid Sick Time poster, which is um, also similar to the Jersey City poster. It has to be posted in English and any language if. Um, some other cities in New Jersey that do have mandatory posting requirements are Morristown, Montclair, East Orange, Passaic, Patterson, Bloomfield, New Brunswick, Plainfield, Elizabeth, and Irvington. In New Mexico. There are a couple of cities with posting requirements. Um, in Santa Fe, all employers have to post the Santa Fe Living Wage Ordinance poster, um, and it has to be posted in both English and Spanish. Um, this is another poster that gets updated at least once a year when the rates increase. Um, it's on an annual um, increase schedule. And it was last updated in February 2017. In Albuquerque, all employers have to post the Albuquerque Minimum Wage poster. Um, this also has to be posted in both English and Spanish by um, every employer. And this one also gets updated frequently. Um, it was last updated in November of 2016. Um, as far as New Mexico is concerned, there are also, um, besides the ones we covered, there are mandatory postings for Las Cruces and Bernalillo County. In Maryland, um, there are two major counties that have posting requirements. First. 
Um, there are mandatory postings for all employers in Montgomery County. And um, this uh, Montgomery County covers several major towns and cities, including Rockville and Gaithersburg. Um, it's a large county. The first poster is the Montgomery County Earned Sick and Safe Leave poster. Um, and it covers information about um, employees' paid sick leave rights under that law. And this poster was last updated in December 2016. Um, the second poster um, is the Montgomery County Minimum Wage poster. And, um, you know, it covers, it informs employees of the current minimum wage rate. Um, and that poster is issued by the Maryland Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation. It did not have a, a very recent change. Um, in Prince George's County, Maryland, all employers have to post the Prince George's County minimum wage poster um, as well. Um, and it's also issued by the Maryland Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation. Um, no recent changes to report. Um, okay, and then really quickly, just to shift a little to the Midwest, um, I wanted to mention in Chicago, all employers have to post the Chicago minimum wage poster. And this is another one that gets updated frequently, um, at least once a year when rates increase. Um, it's tied to a scheduled um, rate um, step. Um, and this one is enforced by the Chicago Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection. Okay, um, now we're going to move back to the West Coast and talk about some posting requirements in Washington State. In Spokane, all employers have to post the Spokane Earned Sick and Safe Leave poster. Um, this one's actually a fairly new poster. It um, just went into effect for the first time in January, uh, on January 1st, 2017, and it informs employees of their paid um, sick leave rights. Um, then in Seattle, all employers in Seattle have to post the Labor Standards Ordinance poster. The, um, I'm sorry, the Seattle Labor Standards Ordinances poster. And this one lets employees know about um, their minimum wage. It also covers wage theft fair chance, and sick leave rights. Um, and it's issued by the Seattle Office of Labor Standards. It covers a lot of different laws. This one had a mandatory update. The last mandatory update um, was in December 2016. In Tacoma, there's a law providing employees with um, paid sick leave. And um, this law actually says employers must provide each employee with information about the law. But it could be done in a handout or a poster. You just have to make sure you're providing each employee with information about the law. So most employers choose to comply by just posting the information, you know, in the form of a labor law poster. It's just a lot easier um, to display a poster than to um, try to make sure you cover every new employee and, you know, give employees um, forms and handouts and updates and, and everything. Um, Tacoma also has its own minimum wage law. Um, and like the paid sick leave poster that I just mentioned, um, the paid sick leave law, this minimum wage law in Tacoma says that employers have to provide each em employee with information about the law. So um, it could be done in a handout or a handbook or, you know, um, you know, distributed that way. But most employers choose to comply by posting the information. Um, posting does comply with the requirement. Um, this one's also enforced by the City of Tacoma, and it was last updated in November 2016. So, um, like I said, we only have time today to highlight some of the major city and local posting requirements and, um, you know, recent changes. But um, there is so much local legislation out there affecting these city and county posting obligations, um, both pending legislation and some laws that have already passed, but the posters just haven't been issued yet, uh, which means there are really a lot of um, changes on their way in the coming months, a lot of changes that we're watching. This slide just shows a list of some posting changes that have already been announced on a city and county level um, that will be coming out soon. These are laws that have actually been passed already. Um, the, the, poster just haven't, the posters just haven't been issued reflecting the new laws. Um, so they are on their way. Um, of course, like I said, there are so many others in various stages of legislation that we're watching. Literally, it's in the thousands. Um, but these laws on this slide have already um, been given effective dates. So the corresponding posters, um, you know, would be outdated as soon as the laws take effect. So they're on what we call our poster change hot list, meaning we're just waiting for the agencies to release them. 
So um, just to reiterate, if you're already a Post Regard member, a Post Regard customer, there's nothing you need to do when it comes to any of these new city county postings. Um, anything that I've covered today or anything on this list right here, um, or any new posting requirement that pops up without notice, which is also um, something that we see a lot. You're, um, you will automatically get the new posters as soon as they're released by the local agencies. There's nothing you need to do or ask for. There's no action on your part. They will be sent to you if you're a Post Regard member. Um, they're just part of the, the regular um, federal state service. So, um, well, that wraps it up. I hope you found this presentation to be helpful and informative. I know we went over a lot of posters, a lot of legal requirements and details and trends, but um, there's really a lot to share when it comes to these laws and um, especially your obligations um, when it comes to city and county compliance. If you have any questions or would like additional information about poster guard or any of the compliance issues that I've talked about today, please feel free to contact our compliance specialist, Peter Frey, at 954-970-5702, or you can reach Peter by email at pfrey, P-F-R-A-Y, at hrdirect.com. Thanks again for attending today's presentation, and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon.